recording makes it sound like, like you're you, just courting again. You courted it already. Yeah. And now we're recording it. We're courting. Courting? <laughs> we're courting? I guess an important part of a marriage is to just continue to court mm. your significant other. This is true. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm you, tired, but I'm good. You just filmed a music video. I did, yeah. This dude was sending me pictures of like a ridiculous setup. I mean, this no offense at all. <laughs> like, you guys are a pro band, but like the pictures you were sending, I was like, wow. I, yeah, I was not expecting the caliber of like video equipment and gear and like the whole the whole shebang, just a whole crew of of really uh, knowledged individuals and stuff working on yeah. this thing. Are we too close here? Should we back up? Different lens. Different lens. That feels a little better. Do you feel better? I feel good. Ba -na 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 -na. This is dead. Oh, R.I.P. We're just going unplugged today. Yeah, so we were filming the music video for uh, an upcoming Joshua Powell song, Coffin Club, which we actually recorded here. Yes, and those tracks are available for, if you want to mess with them, uh, on my Patreon. Mm -hmm. We did a video with it using only loud microphones. Yeah, yeah. And that song sounds dope. It sounds so cool. It's, it's really turned out well. Um, we were filming... Uh, in kind of the middle of Indiana on this horse farm type of place. <laughs> and if if you have looked at any of my band stuff in the past, or if you do after this podcast, you'll notice that there's a theme of like large paper mache kind of creature heads. Yeah. Yeah. So can you like intersperse clips in here? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll pull some clips in and I'll, I'll show a little bit of that. <laughs> so we've used those for album releases and previous, uh, previous music videos in the past. And jo all credit goes to Joshua. He, he spends all his time making those and coming up with new ideas and stuff. And I don't want to give too much away, but we're using some of those in the new music video as well. Some new generation of paper mache heads and masks. And I bring all this up because there is one clip where Joshua was kind of crouched in the most monster type of way possible on this pile of like scrap wood and stuff by a barn. And he was wearing a paper mache head mask demon looking thing waving an axe around like he was a maniac with no shirt on. Now, the whole crew was there. But if you are just an innocent bystander, you can't see the crew. All you can see is Joshua crouched <laughs> on this wood pile, <laughs> waving an axe around like a maniac. Was he wearing the head? With yeah, yeah, and he had God. the head on. And <laughs> there was a like a, a, a farmhand, uh, this gal that works there, uh, she's oh. fairly young. I think she's like 15 or something. And she's in charge of like taking the horses out and walking them around. She didn't know that oh. the video shoot was happening. Oh, no. And so she walks up and sees this and uh, immediately calls like the wife of the owner of the place and stuff. And I, <laughs> could you imagine just walking in on something like that? Like you're oh. in the middle of nowhere. Especially as if it, like this is a horror movie. You're it, living it right now. That's exactly my thought. Like you walk in, you're like, I'm going to die now because there were even lights like red lights. yeah <laughs> like, exactly. from the did she walk up from the back uh, so she can't see the crew she yeah. just sees a red glow and some dude in a monster mask waving an axe exactly exactly oh, she's gonna have nightmares forever mm -hmm. yeah she, she was about <laughs> to get sacrificed or something but uh it all worked out obviously we didn't sacrifice her um can you show you have to ask the boys if you can. Can you should show like a, if you're allowed to show that teaser clip you showed me. Tell me what you know. <laughs> it's very cool. They they implemented so many cool like cinematography tricks and stuff. And um, I am not educated in the world of cinematography. Um, I know what a few cameras are and a few lenses and that's about it. But they had this whole rig that um, was like motorized to do uh, rotation and stuff with a little remote control. So the people on the monitors could control the angle and rotation. Um, and there, there are some really cool shots. Fred Miller, our buddy Fred Miller was kind of the one leading all the, the directing and kind of art direction of it. So very stoked to see how it turns out and, um, 
when it does, you know, I'm sure in another episode upcoming, we'll drop a link or something so you can check it out. But it's so a lot of fun for the camera nerds that were shooting on Ari. So yeah, the Alexa 35, I believe it's going to look good. Yeah. Just the unedited, just raw footage that I was seeing from the monitor looks insane. <laughs> Again, I don't know much about it, but the quality with low light, <laughs> it blew me away. Blew me away. It was so good. So and good. The pictures you showed me, it was dark. And that was my first thought. And then you're like, oh, we're shooting Ari. I was like, I mean, I don't know much about the specific cameras other than like they look fantastic and mm -hmm. they win tons of awards. Like movies shot on those just win. But – like okay, these guys know what they're doing. If they're bringing in that kind of equipment, or hopefully they do. Yeah. And from the shots you showed me, yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the coolest thing was that steady cam javelin thing. Like I watched a potato jet video. Uh, very camera nerd. Like potato jet's a fantastic channel. But he goes and he talks to this camera guy who's named Ari, who shoots Ari. Oh no! And has like a custom javelin thing that's like a steady cam, but. He can move this whole rig anywhere around his body or flip it or spin it. Yeah. Like he's the best in the industry when it comes to stuff like that. It's just very wild. cool. Yeah, that's that's exactly how this one was. The the camera guy, he like completely flipped it all the way down so that the camera was just a couple inches from the ground to get <laughs> upward shots of like the breakdowns and stuff for the full band videos or full band shots. Like when you're fully loaded with that gear and there's that amount of springs on your body supporting weight. I would be nervous to flip that expensive of a camera. Oh, yeah. Like just boop. <laughs> well, so we were getting all the final uh, full band shots, and we had one more shot of the night that we wanted to get, which I'm not going to spoil the surprise because we're still going to do the shot for another video, um, but it's not going to make the cut for, for this one. But we looked at the phone, and it was like a 30% chance rain at like 3 a.m. or something. Well, it's approaching midnight, and we look at the phone, and all of a sudden it says 100% chance rain. And we had like 20, 30 minutes with all of this insanely expensive gear. Like you could buy maybe a house or two <laughs> with all the camera gear that we had there. So In today's prices? Yeah. Oof. Yeah. So we very quickly, we were like, all right, we got all the shots. Let's get everything loaded back in the van as fast as we can. But also safely because you don't want to be sprinting Yeah. with – <laughs> More than your own life is worth in your hands. <laughs> oh. So it got a little hectic towards the end, but we got it, and everybody was uh, real professional and um, very cool creative ideas and stuff. That looked like so much fun. Do you have a release date for that song? Not a final release date. Um, we're shooting for as soon as possible, essentially. <sighs> we were doing this song for a while. Mm -hmm. I want this song out. Us too, man. Us too. We so I don't know how much of insider baseball this is, but we're we're following one of kind of the tried and true digital release kind of uh, schedules, I suppose, where you drop a single um, and then you kind of stagger the music video and lyric video mm -hmm. with that. And we don't want to drop a single and then have something hitch the music video, right? And so we can't follow the schedule appropriately. It's tough these days. You got to make plans, and who to think like musicians planning mm -hmm. that doesn't happen i've always wondered how much because it seems like voodoo magic on the back end and there's people who will swear by like release it in this way and you have this magic pixie dust that happens and maybe that's completely true and then you'll go do something with a major label it's like oh you turn it in and the next morning it's on spotify mm -hmm. and there's the music video and there's this and they're like yeah. like how are you doing this so fast <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> i mean a lot more money to throw at something a lot more stuff but i just wonder how much of it is like we're just so scared of doing something wrong that we hold back on making like quick decisions on yeah. something yeah yeah but I don't know the right answer because it's been a long time since I've released my own music. <laughs> I, I don't pretend to know everything about the business side. It, the business aspect of the music industry 
like I took classes. I tried to stay informed, but not uh, obsessive yeah. about it. And it it's never been the aspect that's like excited me or drew me in or anything. It, it's always been, this is a necessity because as a musician, if you want to pursue it full time, you have to have that entrepreneurial aspect to it, you know? So it's very much been a, I'll learn things as I need to, which mm-hmm. is not the great approach probably, you know, if you want to do this and you're kind of starting the journey, maybe you learn a bunch of things you don't think you necessarily need because they'll come in handy. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the best like way to break into a digital market would be. I think it's the easiest thing to overthink because the industry itself is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. Like trying to understand all the intricacies, there's always going to be somebody who can like optimize better than you. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, like optimization will get the eyes immediately, but it's the art that has to keep those eyes coming back or interested. Mm-hmm. So it's like, there's so many different ways to play it, and all of those things have to play well together. Yeah. Because I've seen people with crap who know how to optimize. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and people with, like, sadly, great songs that should go nuts that they just can't get anybody to listen to. Mm-hmm. And that I'm not saying that's the fault of any algorithm. Like, those are typically the individuals who will just put it up somewhere and not say anything about it. Exactly. People are supposed to go find it, right? Yeah. It's just, man, if some really good artists had as good work ethic on the back end as they did, like, creating stuff, they'd be dangerous. Yeah. But, like, that's the bane of an artist, right? Ex- that's <laughs> like- exactly it, man. That's exactly it. But you got to play the game. You got to play the game and you got to move with the rules as they change, you know? I, I don't know. I think a lot of people in this day and age might kind of... Um, wish for how things used to be where you could be playing some local venue and there's just a talent scout there. And as long as you're good and you're in the right place at the right time, they pick you up. But mm-hmm. I'm sure it wasn't as, as you know, rainbows and butterflies as it sounds. But. Dude, there is that side. Yeah, I do. I do remember that. And it was it made for like live shows really interesting because mm-hmm. you knew like, well, there's a scout here. And then it cr- crushed your soul when they just left. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there. Uh, but I guess this is a good segue into something I've wanted to talk about for a while. And it's like, so reality TV, highly entertaining, but especially like the talent shows, Mm -hmm. they have, I guess, fundamentally ruined a portion of the industry or highly misinformed a a large portion of the industry. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a studio owner here, commercial property, and like we do a lot of different types of sessions, which I hire you Mm -hmm. and a whole lot of other players to work on. And I get calls all the time about people like, hey, what's a project look like? And some of those will turn into actual projects. Some of them go to work somewhere else. That's totally cool. Like, you're not always right for every project that comes through your door. You have to know that. <laughs> but there are so many phone calls where some guy, like when I got one this morning, some guy is managing his friend and like, I need to, like, I need to hear this song because it's going to change the world. Mm-hmm. And, like, I need to sign them. And, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like that, that right there, that, like, kind of American Idol, like, yeah. fundamental misunderstanding of how, I guess, how the music industry operates on your local scale and what those individuals who are there at your disposal can provide for you or can't provide for you. And how that all works. Right. Because so many people think I'm a record label or that I'm going to sign them. And when they make it big, I'm going to make a lot of money. Like, do some studios operate like that? Possibly. But, like, I'm here to provide a service. Right. And (laughs) so it's, I don't know. Have you run into anything like that from your perspective? Or is this just like. Yeah. Well, I think that. The the artists in my demographic, you know, the early 30s or even like mid to late 20s 
I think, are starting to realize that the the dream of getting signed, it might be very beneficial. There might be some situations where that is life-changing and game-changing in a really big, positive way. But I think for most people, they're starting to kind of catch on that it's there's not as much uh, runway with that as there used to be, if there really was a whole lot of it. Mm-hmm. And you can really just like kind of keep the middleman out of it if you, like you were saying earlier, if you really invest heavily on the artistic side and the back end side of the business and the dispersion and, you know, however you can get your music into the ear holes of other people that mm-hmm. legitimately love it, you kind of can can be a success. You might not have as easy of an opportunity to get featured in like Rolling Stone or something because there's yeah. probably a lot of um, – there's a lot of those business kind of friendships and stuff in that world. But I mean, look at King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Like they're huge, completely independent, mm-hmm. you know? And that's, that's, I think one of the coolest things about the, the world that we live in right now, when it comes to um, really just art in general, but specifically music, you can, you can be completely grassroots and you can have your bedroom studio and, if you build up the know-how and you stay consistent and you um, spend the time understanding the markets and adapting with them, you know you can you can rise to the top. But. Yeah, and there's a book, um, Long Tail Theory. I okay. think it's I think it's been adapted once or twice. I should probably get up and I'll let you know what it is. But like the, the idea that the there's an economy for any size artist and any niche artist. Like you have a whole set of dedicated fans at any level that can support you from a career standpoint. And if you're not signed, you have less people to pay. You have more creative control. You have, I'm not going to like equate this to like happy versus unhappy, but some people find themselves more happy when they have more control over their creative vision. Mm -hmm. So you could make, the same living as a seemingly much, much, much larger signed artist with a big deal who's pulling in numbers that you just can't fathom. It's highly possible you could be making more money than that individual from from music. With arguably less kind of uh, hourly work, if Mm -hmm. you want to think about it that way. You don't have to do as many meet and greets and show up on as many like TV shows for advertisement and stuff like that. Yeah. And that obsession with getting to that point, I think, spoils so many things. Because there's an artist, I'm not going to call him out, but artist I work with who is just like an unbelievable musician. Like this kid just, he ripped. He's a kid. I think he's older than me. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, unbelievable songwriter. Has done some really cool things and won some awards. And musically a genius. I'm not going to say anymore because it will give away who this person is like on a, on our local scale. You guys probably don't know who it is, but he's putting out gold, but in his mind, he's, he's like holding some things close to his vest until he gets signed. Uh, and I'm like, that's, hmm. How do you explain it to a person like that to be like, okay, if you were even to get signed, um, if that was a possibility, they want to see you functioning as a business yep. and they want to see you, you, you want them to see you in your best operative state because that gives you leverage. That gives you the negotiating power. If one day you got signed, this actually, oh, I'll give a real instance without giving names here. Say you're an 18 year old girl <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, just getting out of high school and you wrote like this viral song about graduating at a time that was really, really difficult. And you got signed because of it. You were on like the today show. You were on all this cool stuff. Um, you got stars in your eyes cause you had immediately gotten signed. You had no leverage cause you had no career before this. Yep. And then after that time period's done, after those graduation songs aren't being listened to anymore, you get dropped. Yes. And now you don't own that material. Yep. Because you got signed, and now in perpetuity, that's owned by someone else who yeah. can do whatever they want with it forever. Including making money off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Hypothetically, that person would got screwed 
Yeah. And every studio that that person worked with didn't get paid. <laughs> Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Oh, so- no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Not all labels operate like that. Not by a long shot. Yeah. But it is the, like, it, it's in your best interest to be the best artist you can be. That sounds so cheesy. But it's it's true, though. Be the best you can be <laughs> at any point. Because, it, okay, say you're doing awesome as an artist or musician. Like, Josh Powell starts taking off, mm-hmm. like, more than it is right now. And you guys are just making bank. And then a label comes in. Like, and they're basically like, hey, we're going to take it from here. Okay, okay, what can we expect as a band? Uh, better distribution, you have a little more, like, more social media stuff at your disposal if you so want it. Okay, what do we have to give up? 50% publishing, ownership rights to all your material in perpetuity, and mm-hmm. possibly in your past. Yeah. And, yeah. Potentially so, like a full 360 deal where they even get merch. Sometimes. I mean, if you guys were already established, probably not a 360 deal, but... I'm just hopefully they not. Exist. That's those are terrible. Yeah, because uh, that's giving the label money for literally everything you do forever and ever. Oh man, you couldn't go do a clinic right without paying them and without getting authorized to go do. Yeah, clinic. so at that point you would have to weigh: okay, is this record deal worth it to add on to something that's already working for us, mm-hmm. knowing that we have to give away at least half of what we're making right now mm-hmm. at least half and that's not to say if there's like some campaign that's happening and you guys have to front some of it but so you would have to do twice the work you're doing charge twice what you're charging put out twice the amount of content you're putting out so obviously these are kind of i'm making up numbers but they're not far off from real numbers yeah. here and so like you said earlier not all labels operate in the same way. These are yeah. some some very broad statements based on kind of some of the most negative aspects that a lot of the bigger labels kind of operate off of. Right. And sometimes the smaller ones too. Well, They're, the publishing would be, I mean, if you have to sign over your rights, that's 50% just right off the bat. Right, yeah. Not including whatever the label would decide to take. So at least half. Yeah. But uh, you... Let's let's take it back uh, a couple couple ideas here. So you were talking about this artist that wants to hold the songs close to his vest until mm-hmm. potentially gets signed and can then put them out. I think another thing that should be understood again: not all labels, not all agencies and stuff, but a lot of the time you will have to send a bunch of tracks. You know, sometimes twenty, thirty, even more. And then they decide which ones you're allowed to put out. Mm -hmm. So for this specific individual, if those songs really mean something to him in a big way, the best time to put them out is now. Because when you have control. When you have control. Because if you do get signed, it's very likely that you won't be allowed to put them out. Or at least possible. Yeah. Maybe not very likely, but at least possible. Possible. There you go. Yeah. I mean, because there there's I'm not gonna go out and say that like labels are completely inhuman. I mean, some suits definitely are, but um, it's if uh, if you're with a label that does respect you and what you're doing, and they see that you're really behind something, then they're going to get behind it too. Yeah, yeah. Or at least, hopefully, you've gotten yourself into a relationship with a label like that, to where there's kind of some mutual respect. Like you're not. It's not like all it is evil. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that mm. whatsoever. It's just. It has kind of become this thing. Like I can't start my career until. I'm signed, and it's such a backwards way to think about it. The label could provide so much more to you if they already see you functioning Mm -hmm. in your top level here because you're firing on all cylinders. And then if you get all this other ammunition behind you and this caravan of, like, distribution and highly focused social media people, like, and people that could genuinely help you out, you want that when you're at your peak because it's just going to take you up. Yeah. Like, (laughs) as opposed to... Well, I have this song, but I don't want to put it out until I get signed. Like, why? Yeah. You're going to get the C tier people working for you. Like, <laughs> I, not, I'm sure not everybody works this way, but 
that also sitting on these things, it's going to create a musical constipation, a creative constipation Ooh. where you have, and I, I could see it also as almost a, um, it, what, what's the word when you're going for something and it's like catching you. I'm just stuck on constipation. Constipation station. Gosh. Oh, like a, like a net, like having these songs that are, in a finished state that mean a lot that you might even think is your best work mm -hmm. is like the safety net of how it, it relieves some of the kind of stress, I guess is the word of creating something newer and even better. Okay. Because, because you can always fall back on these songs that you still have in the chamber that you feel are great. Mm -hmm. So I feel as though one, it's going to keep, someone from pushing for something better, reaching new heights. It's also going to kind of, you still have those ideas in you. I don't know. It's like from a, if, if you're a musician or an instrumentalist or something, I'm sure there's riffs that you noodle on all the time when you're just like picking up your guitar or bass or sitting at the keyboard or something. But when you record those and you get them in a song and you put it out, at least for me, that's like emptying all that stuff out. Mm -hmm. And now I have space for new noodles, new ideas to kind of come forth. Yeah. But if I had all that, like, lyrical content, musical content that's done just sitting there, it, it would still be bouncing around in my head, you know? <laughs> that's just me. That's just me. I don't, I don't know if everybody's that way, but I, I would want to I would want to get that out. Well, and you learn more the more you stuff, put stuff out because you'll realize aspects what people like and what people don't like. Like, let your audience tell you. Yeah. I mean, in literally every aspect of any kind of art form, whether it's music or YouTube, I mean, I can't tell you the amount of videos I put out that I thought were going to do great. And people are like, this sucks. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I now see that. <laughs> but it's it it's a hard thing when you're creative, but you're also, I guess, afraid would be the word. Yeah. I mean... Not that, not to say that it, you're scared and that's why you're not doing it, but there's a certain level of that. Even I feel that a lot, mm -hmm. like putting out your own stuff. I'm, I keep saying putting out my own stuff because I'm working on a song of mine after years <laughs> not doing it, <laughs> which is fun. But it's, it's yeah, keep going back to it's knowing if you're if you're just waiting for somebody to come along and say, no, this is how you're going to do it. And if you need a piece of paper signed by a record label to do it, maybe it's not something you actually want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I don't know. Yeah. Harsh. And for, for full transparency as well, back on the record label thing, um, we are signed to a label. Um, Joshua Powell, the group, we are signed to Romanus Records. And that, like I was saying, there are great labels that exist. Romanus yeah. is, uh, has always been great to us. Chris, who, who runs that whole shebang, is a great dude, awesome guy, helped us out a lot. And there are different types of deals, too. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're super happy with what we do with him. And at the same time, you still have to be wary of the pitfalls like we've been talking about of other labels, you know. So none of what we're saying is don't ever sign to a label. If it's a good opportunity in any regard that works for you as a person and helps you reach the different goals that you have without kind of, I don't know, putting you in a bad spot, stealing yeah. everything that you've ever worked for, then maybe go ahead and do that. <laughs> it shouldn't be the contingency upon if you create art or not. Correct. That's That shouldn't be the end goal and it shouldn't even be, it shouldn't be the start goal, which yeah. is, I guess, how we got into this whole thing because people will constantly call me a recording studio trying to sell me on the fact of why they're good and why they should, why they should record for free. It's just, it's flipped its whole, like, information on what happens with the music industry and how yeah. it works. And yeah. it's just, it's an interesting effect of, I guess maybe America's Got Talent or American Idol. I don't mm -hmm. watch a whole lot of it, but I man, I used to be watching all the American Idols when it first started, like the first three seasons or so. <laughs> I'd watch them all because it dramatic. was dramatic. <laughs> it was revolutionary, like nothing like that, at least that I was aware of, had ever existed. You remember when, like, you could call in or text in and vote, and it was yep. like, wow, 
Look what we like, did. I'm, I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike other things, my vote matters here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's another podcast <laughs> um, that we won't make. That we won't make. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, to to reaffirm one of your points earlier, though, I've I've worked with a previous American Idol, um, I think finalist that is is from our area. Oh yeah, and I don't know a whole lot about her story. I was very much a hired gun, um, and I'm not disparaging her. She's awesome. Um, I didn't watch the season that she was on because by then I had stopped watching. But just to kind of you know reaffirm one of your points of doing that doesn't equal you make it forever. Yeah. Like it, it can be a boost in clout. Some people, sure. They've, they've won uh, some kind of talent show or TV show or something. And because they were prepared and because they had, you know, diligent mindsets and other things to offer, then they can keep riding that wave, but it doesn't always work that way. It, it can be a goal of yours. I'm not here to say what should or shouldn't be a goal, but I think mm-hmm. in every aspect of the music industry, whether it's trying to win a talent show or trying to put out a good album or trying to play a good live show, whatever it is, I think you always have to keep in mind that these opportunities are going to come to you at some point. But it, it's the classic saying of like, you have to be ready for them. You can't either rest on your laurels and think that you're already good enough because at some point you're not going to be. Mm-hmm. No matter how good you are, at some point you're not going to be good enough if you stop working at it. Or not relevant. Or, or not relevant. no longer appealing or any number of things. Yeah. yeah. And we, I don't know, I don't want to bang the drum too much, but one of my kind of favorite things about music, and we've talked about this before, is that there's no ceiling. There's no stopping. Mm-hmm. If you want to keep pushing, you're going to keep getting better in every aspect uh, that there is to do with music or music business even. So... Don't stop, I guess. Don't stop pushing. Don't stop practicing. Don't yeah. stop learning. Don't think that you know it all or you've reached the state that you need to reach to become legendary. And as cheesy as it is, like sometimes failure is the best thing that could happen. Because, I mean, if we're going to take another lesson from American Idol, wasn't there the curse of the American Idol curse there for a while that everybody who actually won ended up having worse careers than the second or third runner ups in yep. those shows. Yep. And I mean, can you, was it the actual deal that did it? Who knows? We weren't there. We don't know what those deals were. Yeah. Was it that maybe the label misidentified who would be the most marketable? Maybe. Could be. Or was it that that failure just made those second and third place people more hungry? Could be that. <laughs> and they realized, I don't need this huge, seemingly huge thing to make my career. If I do this and actually don't have to pay all these other individuals, I can actually make a living at this. Yeah. Let me give it a try. Yeah. So who actually won? And then there's, mm. there's, the, mm. <laughs> then there's the aspect of the pressure. And I think that... Um, yeah. You know, as we've talked about, if you are artistic and that's what you pursue and you you work on kind of commingling your passion and your career, most of us have an aversion to doing stuff that we're required to do but don't want to do. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a blessing and a curse, but definitely a very big curse. And the other thing to think about, if if your main goal is to get signed to a label – you should also consider the extra workload and stress as an artist is going to push on you, which you've talked about with like with these types of bad deals, then you might have to do two times the amount of work and all mm-hmm. the aspects, which is true. But on top of that, if you're independent, well, all of a sudden you don't have a deadline. Mm-hmm. You can just spend as much time creating and tossing out the bad ideas and bringing in new ideas. You get signed. All right. You've got six months. And we need to make this new album. Yeah. And that is the most debilitating thing for some people. For some people, it inspires them to make some of the best stuff they've ever made. Yeah. But it all depends on how you work. Like in school, did you take all the time you could study or did you did you wait? Cram it? <laughs> did you cram it? And how good were your grades? Exactly. Like, I mean, if you were that type of person who could put it off and get straight A's, maybe you should go out and get a record deal. I'm just <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah. And I mean, that whole illustration with you guys, I knew you were like, Mm -hmm. and that's, I guess I should make the distinction between like, well, I mean, I guess even some indie labels I've had horrible experiences with, but you guys have, you guys are in a good position Mm -hmm. and there are a lot of different deals in what that can look like. And some labels are very hands off Yeah, and they just want to be a part of something that works. And like, that's because you guys worked mm-hmm. before that relationship, I would assume. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, like, there, there's a good example of how that can be, like, beneficial for both parties. Because a label's not going to take on something they're not going to benefit from in some way. Right. The label, um, the business is there to make money. Yeah. And so. And it should. Yeah. Because you want them to stick around for you. Exactly. <laughs> well, and as this is the other tricky thing about being an artist. But as a career, like, you need to be there to make money, too. Yeah. Like, you need to survive. If you want to be surviving off your art, then you have to find the value in that and earn money with it. And it, there's a lot of times where that sucks. The whole idea of, like, I have to charge for all this or yeah. I have to, you know, go and, and try to make money off of my labor of passion. Like, that doesn't always feel good and it doesn't always sit well. And it can also evoke all types of imposter syndromes and other philosophical dilemmas for people. But at the end of the day, it's what you have, you have to do. You're an artist that is also a business. Mm -hmm. And that's that maybe this is a whole other discussion for another podcast, but I have, I don't even want to call it a theory. I guess thoughts that have really just been like hashtag shower thoughts, I Mm -hmm. guess of like, not for profits in the realm of music like do they help or do they hurt like a local music scene interesting and i have thoughts on either side and i think that would be an interesting topic i don't think i have all the answers and it could be embarrassing and i don't want to disparage anybody who <laughs> deals with not for profits because they definitely have their place in certain aspects but like if you're looking at it as a whole mm-hmm. do they stand to benefit or or inadvertently kind of injure or stunt a music industry from a local standpoint. Yeah. That is an interesting idea. We what should, do you think? I don't I don't know right off the bat. <laughs> but I think that we should we should probably hold on to that one for another episode. I guess what I would say is if you are in a position of like having a studio and talking with individuals, like there's a certain amount of education you can provide, but those types of clients who just and you know when you get those phone calls like there's no other portion of a career there that, that's kind of difficult but for artists when you're looking at it don't expect like a studio or your local services around you to be the ones to prop up a career it could happen you could be a savant but it's definitely in your best interest to Figure this thing out as much as you can on your own before anybody else steps in with any amount of creative control or business control over what you're doing. If you have, if you can drive the car for as long as possible, it's going to be way better for you in the long run. Yeah. So, and to, to piggyback off the analogy, if you learn how to change your own oil and yeah. do minor repairs, then you're not going to get screwed over by the, the technician that's trying to charge you way too much and tell that's you the a, things that are wrong that aren't. That's a fantastic metaphor in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> like, in like, if... Because I've seen deals. I've seen deals uh, on paper where, like, because it, don't think if you get signed to a record label that you're not going to be paying for things. You definitely do. Yes. And a lot of times you're paying that stuff back and some of the label, label projects that I get, like the smaller ones... Uh, like bands will be paying through PayPal bill me later because they're getting better deals than mm-hmm. they are through their label. So, but those line item things, if you haven't done it yourself and you don't know what it costs to put on a show, or if you don't know what tour support should cost, or yep. if you don't know what recording a record should cost or how much time it should take or what a producer should charge, like you're, you're trusting them and that could that could be a good thing or it could be a really bad thing for you can be a terrible thing i mean we don't need to dig into it but if you want to hear some more horror stories look at the the tiktok music deals that have been made oh i haven't looked at any of them man dude they are bad really they're very bad (laughs) and and these are for 
uh, a lot of them miners, you know, that get promised all this money, but just like you say, they don't understand that in the fine print, this is like an upfront amount of money for you to do this work that then gets paid back. Yeah. And so these kids are signing deals for what they think is like, I don't know all the correct numbers, but like a million dollars, a couple million dollars or something. And all of a sudden, my gosh, like they just had a, you know, 30 second viral song. They're not prepared or ready or understand how to create an album Mm -hmm. or to go on tour or do any of that. So now you're not even 18 and you're a million or more in debt to this company (laughs) that now owns all of your stuff. So if, if you, if I was able to stand there in front of that, individual who had an audience and was clearly doing something right to get a deal like that to go out there and fail a couple times. Yes. Just put this thing on the, on the back burner for a second. Cause they're still going to want you. It's not like in a couple months, they're not going to want to do this deal. Go out and do a show. Yeah. Go out and record something in a, in a professional studio, hire some players, hire a producer, just create a full song. Maybe <laughs> that's a whole other thing. <laughs> I have had – is this the TikTok thing? Like I've I've literally mixed – I just finished one that was a minute and 40 seconds long. Um, that's really short. I think that's the TikTok thing, yeah. I believe that you can upload up to three minutes, but for the algorithm, that's not yeah. – that's like way too long. The songs are getting shorter. Yeah. Songs used to be pretty short too. I mean, but they are – I feel like they're both getting shorter and longer depending on kind of – which segment of music you're in. There's a that what's you should joke somewhere in there. I don't know. Somewhere. <laughs> anyway. Well, Jeremy, we could keep going down the nihilistic rabbit hole of labels. <laughs> Some are good. A lot Some of, definitely a, are. A lot of great ones exist. It Just like there are great people and bad people, there are great labels and very, very bad labels. What you should take from this is not that labels are bad or that Jeremy has a chip on his shoulder, which maybe I do. What you should see a chip. Are we looking for lays? The shirt is covering it. And and Uh. so, um, what you should take from it is just continue to work hard and try to do it yourself as long as possible. It's going to be better for you in every single instance. And if the opportunity comes along, be prepared for it and as best as you can be educated for it. For sure. Yeah. Jeremy, what have you been listening to? Oh, crap. I got some stuff. You got some stuff? I got some stuff. Some stuff and things. Let me pull it up, y'all. Y'all. <laughs> right, y'all. I don't know if I could share this one, but have you listened to this record? No. Is it good? <laughs> it's like if metalcore and rap had a baby. I like both of those things. Dude, it's wild. Is it just lyrical content? Is that why you can't? If Limp Biscuit went hard, like, yeah, that's cool. I never got into listening to. Maybe this is my wreck. Again, I don't know anything about this band. Somebody showed it to me, and I was like, okay. This is, I know a lot of people listen to rap when they work out, and mm-hmm. I never got into it. And he was like, I want, "Try this, try this." So it's like, if I guess metalcore and rap had a baby, that's this. Unity TX. I think and the it's, records ruckus or mad boy mad boy is the record i don't yeah. listen i just listen to it on shuffle i really sometimes in these wrecks i'm like i hope these bands haven't done something like horrible <laughs> that we're just recommending <laughs> for sure this is all musical so i have no idea what these guys stand for but i was digging it so check it out very cool <laughs> um so i played uh, a show this past week um, with a new group that I'm playing with, Macy Ann, and we were sharing the stage with Nina Strauss, Starbenders, and Diamante. So all of those could be record wrecks, but I'm just going to stick with um, Diamante first because I hadn't, I I knew of Nina Strauss, but I never listened to to her music at all, and I had not heard of these other two bands. Apparently, they're pretty big deals. Their, their streaming numbers are pretty nice. But um, Diamante has uh, some pretty cool tunes, but I was I was listening through their newest album um, the last couple of days just to kind of hear more of what they're about. And this tune, Ghost Myself, is pretty, pretty proper. Yeah. 
Ooh, the bass tone. Yeah, that's the first thing that popped out to me was the bass tone. It's just, it's gnarly and it, it I don't know. It's really gross, but it fits really nicely with it. Really like clear, poppy almost vocals. Yeah. But super gritty musicality. And they performed as a three piece, actually, at the show. Were they running, running tracks? Yeah, they, they yeah. had uh, bass tracks. Um, I love when a band can do that well. They did it very well. I think the days of like, like, Getting upset that bands are playing with tracks are kind of over because now you can adapt it live so well and use it as an instrument just as much yes. as anything else. Yeah, so. and you have, I mean, there's so much technology these days that really helps implement it. Mm -hmm. um, when it's done well, I really appreciate it because I think part of it is accepting and understanding that unless you have 12 people on stage, you're not going to get an authentic version of a lot of recorded songs because mm -hmm. there's so many layers or so many instruments and stuff going on. And if those things are added to improve a song or to heighten different emotional context for it, then I want that in a live experience, mm -hmm. but I want it done well, like you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they played their butts off. It was great. Um, their drummer, he, he was so sick, but he, he was a heavy, heavy hitter in the best kind of way to where there was one part in the song where he had to like throw his drumstick in his mouth so he could tune his snare head as he was playing. <laughs> and it was like three songs in just cause he was hitting so hard. <laughs> it was sick though. The guitarist players. Give that boy some lug lock <laughs> for real. I think they actually shout out to Sweetwater cause they, all of the bands were renting all their gear from Sweetwater. The show was in Fort Wayne. Oh yeah. That was a noise I just made. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta clip that one. <laughs> oh. But yeah, Diamante, uh, Ghost Myself, check them out. See if you're see if you're into that vibe. It's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> um, what what should they drop if they stuck with us this long? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. How about maybe a maybe like a, a vinyl. Don't they have little record emojis? Ooh, I think so. Yeah. If not, then the CD emoji. I know there's some kind of uh, physical music media emoji out there. Or so, if you can't find either one of those, just put the fist in the air. Like, fight the man. Fight the man, indeed. Who needs a label, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Are you signed to a label? Have you worked with labels? Do you have any positive or negative stories about labels? Let us know. Let uh, us know. Tell us in the comments. Make some friends in those comments. Talk it up. Chat it out. Until next time. Bye. Bye. I need to figure out more emojis.